Hi, everyone. Just giving you about a five minute warning. We're going to allow all the live feeds to get settled. So we're look to begin around the 1231, 1232 mark. See you back in a few minutes. Hi, everyone. Harold again, just waiting another minute or two to let all our live feeds uh, get situated and we'll be beginning uh, momentarily. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Welcome not only to the media on this Zoom, but to all the fans watching live feeds on all Mets social outlets, including SNY, WFAN, and MLB Network. With that, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Mets owner and CEO, Steve Cohen, for some opening remarks. Good afternoon. I went to my first Mets game with my dad at the old polo grounds. Years later, my friends and I used to sit in the upper deck at Shea Stadium. That makes today a dream come true, not just for me, but for my wife, Alex, and my whole family. Alex's dad, Ralph, makes it to just about every home game. They're all rabid Mets fans. I have a lot of people to thank today. Let me start with Fred Wilpon. We've been watching games together for many years, and he's one of the true gentlemen in baseball. Thank you, Fred, for bringing me in as a minority owner back in 2011. And thank you for your support as we transition the ownership of the team. I also want to thank Commissioner Manfred and my fellow owners for their guidance and support. And finally, I want to thank my fellow Met fans, the greatest fans in baseball, your support has been incredible. You want us to win the World Series, and so do I. New York fans have high expectations, and I want to exceed them. I want an exceptional team. I want a team that's built to be great every year. I don't just want to get into the playoffs. I want to win a championship. Now, owning a team is a civic responsibility. You hold the team in trust for the community and for the fans. That's how I see my role as the owner of the Mets. And that's why Alex and I plan to invest in communities around City Field. Alex is going to lead the Mets Foundation. She's done a great job leading our family foundation. She gets involved and really knows the organizations and the communities we support. And I know she'll do the same here. Some of you may have noticed I've been tweeting with the fans. Our fans matter a lot to me. We may not always agree, but I will listen to what they have to say. I want Met, Mets fans to have a great experience with us at City Field and on our media platforms. You may ask what kind of owner I'm going to be. I'm going to be an owner who builds a team that has continued success. We want to create a blueprint for winning. We will hire great baseball people like Sandy Alderson. Sandy and I share the same philosophy. We want to make great play, find great players and make them better. We are starting with our homegrown talent and building from there. When we need to fill a gap, we will fill it. It might be with a free agent or it might be through a trade. We're going to strengthen our farm system, keep our players healthy, and use the best analytics. We're going to build a process that produces great teams year in and year out. You build champions. You don't buy them. And we have a great core on this team. And we're going to get better. And I plan to make the investments we need to succeed. We want to win now, but we're also building for the long term. In my investing business, I get judged every day. I know you will judge me every day, too. I'm all in. Let's go Mets. Thank you very much, Steve. Ask a to ask please a question. click on the participants tab, followed by the raise your hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Prior to your question, please restate your name and affiliation for our audiences at home. If you prefer to ask your question in Spanish, we do have our translator, Alan Suriel, here on the call to facilitate. Team President Sandy Alderson, of course, is also here to answer your questions. But we'd like to begin this portion of the conference with all your questions you have for Steve Cohen. That way, once completed, Steve will be able to exit the call and Sandy will remain to answer all your remaining questions for him. So with that, our first question is to you, Steve Gelbs. Hey, Steve, Steve Gelbs from SNY. Uh, first of all, congratulations. Thank Clearly you, Steve. 
uh, one of the reasons that Mets fans are so excited about this is that they feel like the team was purchased by one of them. And you started talking about this a little bit. Uh, you're a lifelong, passionate Mets fan. What is your earliest and, and greatest Mets memory? And what was it that originally made you fall in love with this franchise? franchise. Well, like I said, you know, I went to the Polo Grounds with my dad, uh, I think 1963. And, you know, I used to go with my buddies. We used to take the train from Great Neck, take it to uh, Shea Stadium stop, and, you know, sit in the upper deck. We had a phenomenal time. And, you know, that's when you develop your affiliations with teams, you know. So I was 13 when they won their first World Series. And so, you know, it's, it's, I'm a baseball fan. My family's, you know, great ba Mets fans, great baseball fans. And so, um, you know, it's going to be a family uh, effort here, and uh, we're all very excited. Steve, you spoke about your vision for this franchise moving forward. Why was Sandy Alderson the right man to execute that vision right off the bat in your mind? Well, first, he knows the Mets organization. I mean, obviously, a lot of the same people that, were, that he brought up as players are, you know, now obviously doing great things, you know, with the Mets. Um, Plus, he, you know, he's a total professional, and, and he's had a lot of experiences in baseball, and I've got a lot to learn, and I can't think of a better person to learn from. Thanks. Your next question is from Anthony DeComo. Hi, Mr. Cohen. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. You can kind of run the gamut in terms of how involved they are in all aspects of the organization. How involved do you plan to be in various aspects, uh, particularly in baseball operations? Well, you know, I'm, I, I, I played Little League once, you know, but it's about it, right? So uh, I'm going to let the professionals, Sandy, and, you know, the people we bring in, let them run baseball. Uh, I'm sure they'll make recommendations to me, and, you know, it, it'll be a, a collaborative effort. Uh, but ultimately, they're the experts. And, and generally, but, you know, I hold people accountable, just like I do in my business at Point72. And, you know, I ask probing questions and, you know, I expect reasonable answers. And it, it'll be a two-way conversation, but ultimately they're the experts. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is from Disha Dozar. Hey, Steve, congratulations. Thank you. Um, just two-parter here. What's the current job status of uh, Luis Rojas? Uh, I'm going to throw that over to Sandy if you don't mind. Um, so if you guess gonna, not, you know, yeah, yeah, Sandy, Sandy will be unmuted momentarily. Okay. I can tap dance if you want. <laughs> I think I'm unmuted. Uh, thanks, Deisha, for that for that question. Um, so I have talked to Louie uh, a couple of times since uh, Friday, and uh, most recently yesterday. Uh, we talked about his situation. We talked about his coaching staff. Uh, what I told Louie was that it's very likely he will be managing the Mets in 2011. Uh, but I left the, the door slightly ajar uh, out of sort of respect for the process we're going through now to find a, a president of baseball operations. I don't want to foreclose that person from having some input. But uh, uh, I did have those conversations with Louie. And um, as I said, my expectation is that he will be managing the Mets in 2011. Thanks, Sandy. And then just um, one more for Steve, if I can. Just what was that moment like when the Wilpons announced in February that your original agreement to purchase the Mets had collapsed? And did that kind of just intensify your desire to eventually become the owner? Well, listen, I put a lot of time in, uh, in, in trying to figure out if this was the right thing for me to do. And and, you know, my whole team at my family office did a ton of work. So it was disappointing, you know, because I really wanted to make it happen. And uh, but, you know, so be it. It was a complicated transaction. And sometimes when things get complica complicated, they fall apart. And that's what happened then. And, and, you know, but here we are. We're sitting here today and and managed to work it out. And I'm really excited. Thank you, Steve. A reminder, if everybody, just for our audiences at home, if you could restate your name and include your affiliation. Um, with that, the next question for Steve will be from Mike Kuma. 
Mike Puma from the New York Post. Uh, Steve, as you mentioned, you've been a minority partner for, uh, for several years. I'm just wondering, uh, is there any point you became uh, frustrated with the manner uh, the Wilpons were, were running the team? Well, you know, listen, I'm not going to, you know, uh, I'm not going to comment on, you know, they, they own the team, they can do what they want. And, um, and I was a minority owner, so I sort of equate a minority owner to being a, like a season ticket holder. Okay, you don't really have a lot to say, so, um, you know, so that was that, and, and uh, but here we are today, and now I am the owner, and so I get to, you know, be in charge myself. And, it's, it's, you know, for years, uh, the complaint's been the, the team doesn't spend enough money. Uh, it seems the team's in a position now to, to spend a lot more money if it wants to. I mean, where, where, where could you see payroll going conceivably well I'm not gonna talk about a budget today um, you know Sandy and I have been in conversations on that and uh, but what I do believe is this is a major market team and it should have a budget commensurate with that thank you next question is from Tim Healy hi Steve I'm Tim Healy from Newsday yeah I was just curious <laughs> owning the Mets having the Mets do you see that as more of a business, like point seventy two, or a hobby, like collecting art? Well, um, the amount of work that's going to be required here is, you know, more than a hobby. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't consider it like point seventy two. I consider it um, something that uh, I'm essentially doing it for the fans. You know, I mean, when I really thought about this, you know, I can make millions of people happy. And what an incredible opportunity that is. And so, you know, that's how I'm thinking about this. You know, I'm not trying to make money here, okay? Like, I, I have my business at point seventy two, and, I'm, you know, I'm, I make money over there. So here, it's really about, you know, building something great, uh, building something for the fans, uh, winning. And, you know, I just, I just find this an amazing opportunity, and, I, you know, and I'm, ex I'm so excited for it. Thank you. Your next question is from Justin Toscano. Justin Toscano from The Record. Uh, congratulations, Steve. Thank you. So, you know, being a fan, had followed the team. So throughout the last decade, what did you feel was missing from this franchise being able to, to reach that top tier? And how do you, with your resources, plan to, to provide that to fill those gaps? Well, you know, listen, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not going to speak about, you know, the, uh, the Mets previous to my ownership, but what I am going to say is that, you know, we're going to build a professional organization. Um, we're going to build out our processes, and, and uh, whether it's analytics, whether it's scouting, whether it's, um, you know, development of players, um, you know, we want to be excellent in all areas of this game. Um, that's going to require resources, and I'm fully committed to making that happen. Um, you know, I I'm not in this to be mediocre, you know, that's just not my thing. You know, I, I want something great. And I know the fans want something great. And so that's my goal and that's that's what I'm gonna do. And on, on Twitter, you mentioned taking those suggestions and you, you actually replied to, to quite a few of them. Were yeah. there two or three that, that maybe particularly interested you as things you would like to institute maybe as early as next year? Well, you know, I, I depending on whether we have fans or not, I mean, you know, having an old-timers day would be kind of fun. Um, you know, I don't know why we wouldn't do that. Um, you know, I, you know, we, it, it appears like the Tom Seaver statue will be ready to be unveiled, so we should have, uh, fest, you know, festivities around that. Um, and, um, uh, you know, but there were so many great ideas, and we put them all, um, you know, we archived them, and, um, you know, and the, you, can, you can just tell the fans are really, really knowledgeable. They know what they're talking about, and they're the and they're the customer. You know, so I've got to listen, and I want to listen. Your next question is from Bruce Beck. Steve, congratulations. Thanks, Bruce. Um, how do you balance trying to win now and making a splash with trying to establish sustained success over the years? Well, first, I think we have a really good core of players already. And so I think we're starting with a pretty good base. 
Um, you know, so you know we've got to we've got to work on parallel tracks here. We've got to obviously we've got to build up our baseball management team. We've got to install processes and and ways of doing things that sustain excellence over a long period of time. Um, but you know we 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 want to we want to win today, which means you know we're going to have to make sharp baseball decisions on on you know who to bring in and who you know. Who to go after, and and um, and you know I've yeah, that Sandy's department, like I've said, and they're the they're going to be the experts, and they're going to make recommendations, and and but you know I'm not in this for a short term fix, okay? I'm I'm really like thinking about this of trying to build a sustainable franchise, okay? I don't want to be good one year and bad three years, okay? I want to be good every year, and that's the goal. So you know that's the type of uh, business and you know team I want to build. Otis, the next question is for you. If you'll introduce yourself. Um, Otis Livingston from CBS Two. Um, congratulations, Steve, on the purchase of the New York Mets. You spoke really emotionally about being a fan growing up and being at uh, different ballparks and watching them play. How do you separate? in your decision making being a fan and also being a businessman because some owners can be emotional and go out and make changes you know that they feel are necessary well I can only tell you the way I run my uh, my business at point 72 and I'm very measured you know I'm very calm and very try to be very thoughtful about things I think impulsive decisions tend not to work and so um, I want to make sure there are checks and balances within the organization so that, you know, I want my people to feel like they can feel comfortable and tell me, hey, if I feel this way and they feel differently, I want them to tell me, you know, and that's how good decision making is made. Um, you know, I may have a, a thought, you know, they can shoot it down if they want, you know, like, like I said, I'm, 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 I'm the new guy at the table here, all right, so I got a lot to learn. And so that's why I need to surround myself with real professionals. And I'm a pretty quick study. Um, so, you know, over time I'll get better and I'm not worried about that. Um, saying that, you know, I've got a day job too. So I've got to make sure that, you know, that the, the team is operating, you know, at, at, at you know, full, at, at full, full power, you know, at, um, you know, even when I'm doing my day job. So uh, and I, I anticipate building that also um, as a fan how much is it burning inside of you to not only bring one World Series to Queens but multiple World Series titles well you know the way I look at that is you, you win one you got to win one first all right so you got to get started and then uh, but you know I have a feeling that's a good feeling and you want more of that so um, I, I suspect that's what you know I'm gonna be shooting for and you know, and that's that's what makes it fun, right? I mean, you know, you want to win. You, you know, uh, no no one remembers you came in second and third place. Next question is from Bradford Davis. Hi, um, hi, Steve. Uh, Bradford Davis, in New York Daily News. Nice to meet you, and congratulations. Um, so I do know, you know, a number of you know uh, a, a number of city people workers were excited about the financial support that you had, you know, reportedly committed to them. Um, as many of them aren't working in the normal shifts at the park, uh, do you have a timeline for providing that uh, that support? That, uh, you know, I mean, that might be a question for your your wife as she's running the foundation. But I didn't want right. to ask that. So I, I didn't really fully understand the question. So, w w uh, I, I apologize to, to, re to restate. You know, I know that a number of city field workers were excited about the about the financial support that you reportedly committed to them while they're not working the usual shifts at the park. You know the consequences of the pandemic and everything. And I was curious if you had a timeline for providing that financial support to, you know, out of work city field employees. Well, I mean, you know, I think, um, um, I think we're doing, I think we committed to doing that. I own the team. So that should start fairly soon. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, listen, we're committed to support our communities. Um, you know, we're, my wife is so good at this. I mean, and you're going to love her. And and she's she's all in too, so um, you know it's it's an important part of you know being involved with a baseball team. You know the communities care about it. We care about the communities, and um, you know 
we're going to we're going to investigate, find out things that are worth uh, backing and and providing support for, and, and I look, we look forward to that. Thank you. And uh, and just to follow on, just you know, community involvement. Obviously, this is this was a crazy year between the pandemic, but also the you know the many protests that even baseballs you know became a part of with the Black Lives Matter movement and everything. And I'm curious uh, how you see the men's organization under your leadership. Um, you know, being a part of this broader sort of uh, conversation and activism on social justice? Well, listen, I mean, I, you know, I think these are important questions that, you know, uh, America is discussing. Uh, black lives do matter. Um, you know, I feel it's really important that we, we have a diverse group of employees, um, not just for the sake of diversity, but for the sake of diversity of thought. People come from different backgrounds. I think it makes for a much more richer environment to have people from you know different walks of life. Um, you know, um, I'm, uh, if if my players want to express themselves, you know, they, that's they're entitled to do it. They, you know, it's freedom of speech. The only thing I ask for is, if they're going to do it, just make sure when you're between the lines, you give 100 percent. Next question comes from Ron Blum. Ron, we're going to come back to you. The next question will be from Mike Vaccaro. Hi, Steve. Mike Vaccaro from the New York Post. Congratulations. Hey, Mike. Uh, two questions, disparate questions about your background as a Mets fan. One, uh, can you name one or two players or one or two moments of your younger days as a Mets fan that really stick with you all these years later? And two, in your conversation with fellow Mets fans on Twitter, I mean, do you get a real sense that they kind of look at you as being what they could be if not for, you know, deeper pockets and different circumstances? Well, you know, the first question I mean, I, Cleon Jones making the catch in left field to win the World Series. Um, and I think I mentioned, you know, Tom Seaver, um, you know, the uh, Jimmy Qualls, um, you know, breaking up the perfect game in the ninth inning. Um, so that, those stick out as two great moments. And then even one more, the obvious one, the, you know, Mookie hitting the ball through Buckner's legs, which was an extraordinary, you know, moment in baseball. So uh, uh, lots of good memories. And so what, what was the second question? Well, when, when you've had these conversations with uh, Mets fans on Twitter, obviously a pretty, they're, they're a pretty excited and excitable bunch. I mean, do you get the sense that they kind of view you as being their proxy almost? Uh, you know, they would be you if not for different, if for different circumstances and deeper pockets? You know, I, listen, I, you know, I grew up in Long Island. You know, I, you know, I don't have a big ego. You know, I'm doing it for them. Um, you know, uh, I'm a low-key guy, and, and uh, I, 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 I relate to them. I know how they, I feel, I feel, like I know how they feel. And, and these are smart, these are smart fans. They know what they're talking about. And if they're emotional, that means they care. I'd rather have emotional fans that are passionate than fans that don't care. And so, you know, I think it's phenomenal, and, and I think it's a, uh, I love talking to them, and, and I, I didn't know I would love talking to them. I did it, and I started enjoying it, and so I'm going to keep doing it. And, you know, there'll be times when, you know, things aren't going so well, so well and I'm still going to do it. Next question comes from Mark Carrig. Hi, Steve. You're just talking about being a Met fan. You know, you talk to a lot of them, and, and there's always that resent about the Yankees kind of being – the bigger team, getting all the free agents. How do you see that balance now that you're the owner of the Mets? Do you, do you see yourself trying to compete with them for those types of players, beating them for those types of players and reshaping the identity of the franchise in a way? I'm not competing against the Yankees, okay? I mean, this is the Mets. We're going to create our own excitement. You know, I'm competing against, uh, you know, 29 other clubs in, in MLB. All right, so, uh, you know, it comes down to, you know, us making good decisions, um, being, uh, you know, taking advantage of opportunities that arise, um, which we're going to do. And, you know, I'm a very motivated, 
very proactive type of guy. I just don't sit back and just accept mediocrity. And so um, that that's you know, listen, you got to set goals. You got to set goals for the for the team. You got to set goals for the fans. You know, we should set high goals. You know, we shouldn't accept you know just making it to the playoffs. That's not good enough. And so that means we're going to have to go out and get great players, develop great players, provide them with the resources that they they're going to need. Um, you know, in all parts of the organization. That's what we're going to do. When setting goals, uh, how many seasons uh, will, will you be pleased with them? Like when the Mets win the World Series, like is it going to be one year, two, three? Like, what is your standard for that? Well, you know, only one team wins the World Series every year, right? So that's a pretty high bar. But if I don't win a World Series in the next three to five years, you know, I'd like to make it sooner. Then, then you know, obviously, you know, I would consider that slightly disappointing. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Representing, of course, the athletic. The uh, next question is from Justin Walters. Hi, Steve. Justin Walters, Picks Eleven News. I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but you, could you take us back to February? And when the sale didn't go through, was there any trepidation that you weren't going to become the owner? What was your thought process then? Um, well, I mean, like I said, it was a complicated deal. And um, not only that, but I kind of I, I was already starting to think about COVID, too, and wondering if there was actually, you know, how that might affect the deal, too. So I'm not even sure it would have gone through in the end. And so... Um, it didn't happen. Sometimes deals fall through. I mean, it's not a fault to anybody. It's just that's the way it goes. And all you can do is give it a shot. And, you know, and I get, like I said in my statement, I gave it my best shot. And lucky enough, you know, I had the opportunity to come back and get involved, and here I am. And one more. You mentioned about wanting to be a winner. You do a timeline of hopefully winning a championship in three to five years. How should your tenure as an owner be judged? Should it be simply if you guys win a championship, getting into the playoffs? And do you think fans will hold your feet to the fire if those expectations aren't met? Well, if they're not met, then they, they should hold my feet to the fire. You know, listen, in the end, I'm not hitting the baseball, okay? All I'm doing is providing the resources to my management team, and, and ultimately I got to be held accountable for that. And so uh, it's not easy winning a World Series, but like I said before, you got to set high goals. Next question is from Tyler Kepner. Hi, Steve. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Tyler Kepner with the New York Times. Um, I, I want to ask you, what are some principles um, that you can take from your success in the business world and investing that you can apply to baseball, whether it's analytics or just something that has made yeah. you successful in one field, how that translates to baseball? Well, actually, you know, the irony, there's a lot of similar, similarities between my hedge fund and, and a baseball team. I mean, I hire young people, and I, you know, I have an academy. The Mets have an academy in, in the Dominican Republic. You know, we take great pride in developing our people at Point 72. Um, they come up through the organization. That's exactly what's going to happen, you know, as players come through the farm system. I provide them lots of resources so they can do their job as – effectively as possible. That's what I expect to do with the Mets. Um, sometimes we go out and hire people from other firms. Similar to the Mets, they'll go out and sign free agents. So there's a lot of similarities and, and um, um, you know, it's really about talent and developing talent and putting the best people out there that you can do on the field and in the organization too. Is there anything to, um, that you'd like to see in terms of analytics or bringing the Mets up to, up to speed with other trends um, around the game? Is, is there any yeah. emphasis there? Well, I mean, that's part of the, you know, one of the areas that we want to upgrade. Um, we've, you know, I, I use data and analytics in my business at Point72. And, you know, and the Mets do that today. So, you know, we want to build on that and, and – you know, provide all the resources and, you know, the amount of people you need to have a quality analytics department. You know, these are all little edges that you can get by having analytics, and I don't want to give them away to somebody else. Next question comes from Dave Lennon. 
Hi, Steve. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, this is Dave London from Newsday. Uh, I know you gave kind of a vague answer to the expenditures you might have or invest investing in the team payroll, and you said you're going to spend like a like a big market franchise. You know, there's big market franchises, and then there's big market franchises. Do you see like that luxury tax threshold as a suggestion when it's around two hundred million dollars? And you know, do you see yourself as more of the upper echelon of the Dodgers and Yankees type of spending teams? Well, you know, listen, we're we're trying to formulate. The, those thoughts today. I mean, you know, I can I can promise you we're going to act like I said, like a major market team. Are we going to act like drunken sailors, you know, in, in in the marketplace? No. Okay. So, you know, listen. I want to be thoughtful. You know, you can spend a lot of money today, and then tie up your team in bad contracts for the next five years. Okay. Which, you know, so that's part of building sustainable franchise. You want to make decisions, not what works for the next, you know. 60 games, but works for the next few years, and so um, you know we want to be thoughtful about it. I think there, you know, we're in an unusual market today, you know, given COVID, where a lot of teams might, and we're starting to see uh, players, you know, maybe being offloaded because of uh, financial concerns, and and I think Sandy and I want to take advantage of that. So I think there'll be lots of opportunities. I think uh, teams are going to want to talk to us, and we'll see what, see what's available. Thank you. Next up is Maggie Gray. Hi, congratulations. This is Maggie Gray from WFAN. And you're buying a team that has three fourth-place finishes in the NL East in the last four years, hasn't made the playoffs since 2016. How close do you think this team is? And I have a follow-up. Well, you know, I think you can maybe ask Sandy that, you know, he would have a better sense. You know, I mean, my sense is that uh, we have holes to fill. And, uh, you know, clearly we need to, you know, fill a catching. And we need to, um, uh, you know, we need more pitching. Uh, we have a pretty good core of, of, of core offensive players. I think that, you know, so we have, we have good young players, you know. We have the best pitcher in baseball. I think that helps a lot. Um, so we have, we have a lot to build around. And so, uh, but, you know, we came in fourth three years in a row. So, you know, the results speak for themselves. My follow-up question is, it seemed like a pretty spirited competition between yourself and the other bidders for the okay. Mets. Who were the other have bidders? Heard... I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someone you might have heard of, Alex Rodriguez, Jennifer yeah. Lopez, you know, um, you know, minor figures, really. Yeah, yeah. But uh, just kidding. Have you heard from A-Rod or Jennifer Lopez since this has all resolved itself and you have now owned the team? I haven't, and you know, but I certainly wish him well. Next up is Ed Coleman. Hey, Steve. Uh, Ed Coleman from WFAN, WCBS. Congratulations. Thank you. You mentioned uh, using analytics in you know successful businesses and, and your hedge funds and that, and we kind of had a come to Jesus uh, moment in the World Series this year with Blake Snell and the role of analytics. How, how do you view analytics in the game today? How do you view the role in in the game of baseball? Listen, analytics is really important, you know. But even in my my hedge fund, you know, we combine analytics with the human component, and so I'm not going to second guess you know what the Rays did I mean you know <laughs> they got to the World Series it was a heck of a team um, an amazingly put together team and so you know they stuck to their their game plan and that was that's how they operated all year in fact I would argue you know maybe to to make that I think it would be hard to deviate from the game plan that they that got them into the World Series so you know, that's what they did. And, you know, listen, every decision is not 100%. You got to, you know, even with the best information, the best um, analytics, you know, sometimes, it, you know, things happen. And that's just the way it is. Thank you. Next question comes from Jeff Passan. Hey, Steve. Jeff Passan from ESPN. Congratulations. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, when you're looking at what you would like this franchise to be like. Is there a model out there in baseball or maybe in another sport that you say, hey, this team does things really well? Well, uh, you know, I think I like what the Dodgers are doing. 
Okay, I mean, they're really, they have a really strong farm system. They, they take advantage of opportunities in the marketplace for uh, free agents and trades. Um, I think they run a pretty good business operation too. So, uh, you know, I think, I think that's one team that, you know, easily, uh, you know, seems to make the mark in, in the type of places that I, I want to do the same. So, um, you know, I'm sure there are others, um, um, you know, and, and, but we also want to do it our way. You know, we want to develop our processes, uh, sort of the Mets way with a Mets culture, which is going to be uniquely ours. And, and, uh, but listen, I'll take a good idea from anybody, you know, and if someone's doing it better than us, I'm going to try to figure out why. And, and in that vein, Steve, when you're looking for a new president of baseball operations, um, what are you seeking in that role? Is it someone analytically inclined? Is it somebody with a scouting background? Is there an archetype that you believe would be best for that job? Well, you would want somebody well-rounded, right? That, that you know, would, have, would have skills in, in all those different areas. Um, you know, I'm not crazy about people learning on my dime. And so, uh, um, you know, hopefully we can find someone that, that feels sort of, you know, is well-rounded and, you know, has, has, a, has abilities in multi-areas. Thank you. Joel Sherman, your mic is live. Steve, uh, Joel Sherman from the New York Post. Um, do you, was there any moment where you had concerns that you would get the necessary ownership votes to get control of the Mets? And what kind of stuff did you have to do between agreement and finalization with the other owners to make them comfortable that you were the right man for this job? You know, I felt I felt like I was going to get uh, approval. Um, you know, I, I do know some of the owners already, and so uh, and they know me, so I, I thought that was pretty helpful. Um, and um, so I wasn't really worried about it. You know, I felt pretty good about it. Does it does it bother you at all that I mean not not every vote could be the you know for premier of North Korea but you weren't uh, unanimous here uh, does that bother you at all that you came in with some people at least having doubt if you were the right person to be the steward of this team listen I can't speak to what they were thinking and and um, you know all I know is I, get, I did get 26 votes and you, and you need 23 to be an owner so uh, I accomplished my goal Next question comes from Tim Britton. Hi, Steve. This is Tim Britton with The Athletic. Congratulations. Thank you, Tim. Uh, you know, you, this isn't your first uh, attempt at buying a Major League Baseball franchise. I was wondering, you know, in the time since you attempted to buy the Dodgers about a decade ago, how much have you thought about what kind of team, what kind of organization you want to build over that time? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I came in second with the Dodgers, which means nothing. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I, I was, I was, it's not easy to find a team that you, that you, you actually, you know, that I didn't want to, I didn't want to travel to certain cities and, and, uh, and so, uh, so I never, I, I actually never felt, I actually felt they may be in, like, I may never get another opportunity to own a team that I would want to own. And lucky enough, the Mets, you know, came up for sale and, and, uh, so now I get the opportunity to put my imprint on a team. And, and you know, I'm a stickler for detail. I'm a stickler for a uh, strong process. I, I don't um, suffer, uh, you know, people who give me responses that are mediocre. Uh, you know, I, I, I see through that fairly quickly. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a micromanager. You know, I really, you know, I hold my people accountable, but I give them a lot of rope to run. Um, I have a day job, right? So I've, you know, I've got two jobs now, and so, um, uh, but I, I feel like we're going to build a, a management team around me that I can, uh, you know, I can you know, collaborate with and and, uh, and and give them the rope to run. You know, like you know, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not going to sit there and second guess every decision. It's not my style. And, and you mentioned uh, building a Mets way and a Mets culture. What if you could describe that in in brief? Basically, what what do you want the Mets culture to be? Well, I want I want professionalism. I want integrity. Um, I'm not going to put up with uh, maybe the type of stuff that that's happened in other places. Um, and I want to hire the best and brightest. 
and I want to I want to uh, create a great farm system, develop our players, um, and uh, you know provide an environment. You know, and also let's not forget the fans. You know, provide a product, and and uh, you know when when they interact with me at at the stadium or on our media platforms, wherever, that their experience is, is extraordinary. Thank you. Next up is Kevin Kernan. Kevin, Dean, unmute. Congratulations. And uh, I'm just curious, you talk so much about um, building through the minor leagues, which I love to hear, and the opportunity you have now to get scouts. but. Uh, I as a Mets fan, not as the owner, what was your reaction when they traded Kalenic, Jared Kalenic, and 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 what that uh, did for the future? Listen, I, I'm not going to question what happened in the past. Um, you know, they made their decision. I'm sure it was well informed. Um, generally, you know, our belief is we want to hold on to our uh, our farm system, you know, and only use them when we're, you know, close to, you know. Uh, if we need to use them as chips to trade for a player that we we do it when we're close to really winning a championship you know I, I, I feel really in my own hedge fund the key to my firm is that we develop talent all the time if I didn't do that and depended on just going out uh, in the world and, and getting uh, hiring people from on the outside I'd be out of business okay so I really feel it's important that we uh, draft well and develop our players and hold on to them. Ron Blum, we're coming back to you. Hey, Steve, when you look at your background and your business experiences, what are the different attributes you've picked up along the way that you think translate well to running a baseball team? I think you got to be patient. You know, you got to you got to create, um, you know, decision making uh, processes in the business that, you know, are sustainable decision making. You know, so that you're planning, you're, um, you know, you're providing, like I said before, resources so that people can do their jobs and do it well. And and um, um, and that's what I do at my hedge fund. You know, I, you know, I provide every resource I can think of so my analysts and PMs can perform to the top of their ability. And that's what we're going to do with the Mets. You know, we're not going to just spend money wildly, but, you know, we want to have great coaches. We want to have great technology. We want to have great analytics. Um, you know, we want to have great people making decisions. We want a collaborative culture, okay? We don't want it being run in an autocratic way. Uh, best ideas come out of the organization, okay? Like some of the best ideas in Point 72 came from someone within the organization who had an idea. And so, like I said, I'll take a great idea from anybody. I think we have time but one more for Steve before we get to Sandy. Uh, Rich Catino, your line is open. Rich, please unmute. I think Rich left. He gave up. All right. We are going to then move on to uh, Bob Clappish. We will wrap up Mr. Cohen with you. Bob, your line is open. Hi, Steve. It's Bob Clappish from uh, Star Ledger and NJ.com. Congratulations. Hey, Thank you. I'm just curious, going back to your days as a rabid Met fan growing up, what was, what was your opinion of the Yankees? If you don't want to comment on them now as an owner, but as a fan, did you admire them from afar or were they brand X? Listen, the Yankees have a great history, right? I mean, they, they've won 27 championships, 28. Um, and um, so, you know, that, that's pretty impressive. And so, you know, that, that, that's, that's what happens when you build a great organization, and, 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 they, and they had that. Saying that, there were times when the Mets were great, too. Right. And, and so, you know, we just want to, you know, be great more often. And so that's what I'm focused on, and, and uh, I'm ready for the challenge. You know, like I'm all in here. Thank you. Great. Steve, thank you very much for uh, your time today. Very much appreciated. And uh, with that, uh, 
We will now turn over our attention to questions for Sandy Alderson. Please again, remember to uh, use the raise your hand icon. And uh, we will begin with the first question from Steve Gelbs. Hey, Sandy. Um, for you, what was the, the key ultimate factor that made you decide that you wanted to come back to the Mets and take on this new challenge? I think it was Steve Cohen. I mean, you've just heard him over the last uh, few minutes. And I think that uh, that's what excited me was the opportunity to come back and work for, work with a guy like Steve, whose vision um, parallels my own. Um, you know, I, I sent him a memo a few months ago, actually, to talk about that. I think we're very well aligned in terms of philosophy and uh, strategy and potential execution. But ultimately, it was about Steve. I mean, look, I, I love the opportunity to be able to come back to the Mets. There are a lot of people there that I know, I respect, uh, I love even. Um, and I'm excited about meeting new people because uh, I'm always excited about uh, new ideas. But first and foremost, it was, uh, it was Steve. And um, so I'm excited about the partnership and um, uh, really looking forward to what happens over the next few months. You know, the last time I won a World Series was 31 years ago. So that three to five year time frame, it's it's uh, a little concerning, but uh, <laughs> we'll live with it. Well, Sandy, um, you know, when this deal became official, you were pretty swift in your decision making parting ways with many members of the front office during this these past couple of years. Why did you feel that that was the necessary first step? And how do you now plan on structuring a new front office? Well, in my experience, I think that anytime there's a change of ownership or a change of leadership uh, at or near the top, um, there are going to be changes made uh, in the, in the uh, levels of leadership. And partly, it, it's not because people aren't capable. It's not because people aren't uh, competent. I have a great deal of respect for Brody and for Allard, and, uh, obviously Omar. Uh, but in terms of how we envision the team being structured, uh, its decision-making processes, as Steve pointed out, all of those have to be aligned with the personalities. So it's not just competency. It's also about um, um, how people interact. And so you know, in addition to that, um, we're going to have a new head of baseball operations. It's not going to be me. And sometimes it's better to make these decisions uh, in advance to give a new person a chance to <clears throat> make their own uh, choices and uh, not have to come in and, and their first act is to uh, um, terminate some people. So, and I felt it was important from a timing standpoint. I felt, felt it was important just for alignment of, of the leadership of the organization. And uh, <clears throat> so um, we ended up doing it on Friday. Thanks. Next up, uh, Tim Healy, <clears throat> your mic is live. Hi, Sandy. Tim Healy. Hey, Tim. Hi. Uh, front office search-wise, what is the state of that and what do you expect – Timeline-wise, given that it's already mid-November. So uh, two things happened on Saturday. Um, we had a new president-elect, and I interviewed my first candidate for uh, president of baseball operations. Uh, so we're already, in, you know, we're already on our way. We're already uh, involved in the process, and um, that was one interview. There will be others. Um, we're currently evaluating exactly how many and who we will pursue, but, you know, this shouldn't take a long time. Um, wouldn't want to put a time limit on it, but, uh, you know, we understand that it's important to uh, get people in place. In the meantime, I've got a small but very capable group uh, remaining. We talk every morning uh, for an hour or so. Um, I have already been in touch with agents for free agents. I've talked to um, some of our own players uh, currently. And um, I've also uh, reached out to uh, Louis Rojas. So there's a lot going on, um, most of it behind the scenes, but I don't think we're behind at all. And uh, uh, 
particularly this year with I think what will be a slower developing free agent market together with a uh, sort of a, a uh, additional market that will de develop uh, at the tender date and, um, and, and through the trading period. So it's gonna be exciting. There are a lot of different options. I think Steve pointed out, we wanna be active in all of those areas. And um, I think we have the resources to do that. And you mentioned sending a memo to Steve a few months ago to, I think, talk, talk about the Mets. Yeah. When did that happen and were you looking to come back? Well, this memo happened uh, well after we'd had our first conversations. And so I thought in order for Steve to be comfortable with me um, that he needed to hear some of my thoughts. And so, you know, I put together something that uh, I thought would encapsulate my thinking and hope that it would align was hit with his. And ultimately, I think it I think it did. But what's important to me is um, not having a job, but having an opportunity to create something really special. And uh, I think with Steve, and you, you've just heard him, I think with his, not just his intellect, but his thought processes and um, um, enthusiasm, uh, together with what I think is the appropriate way to approach all of this from a philosophical, a strategic, and a sort of an execution standpoint. Um, I, I'm, I'm really excited. And with that memo, I think we, you know, we understand each other pretty well. And um, um, as I said, I, I'm really excited. And I think that uh, we're on the right page and we're, we're heading the right direction. Ed Coleman, we're gonna come to you next. Hey, Sandy, welcome back. Congratulations, good to see you. Uh, you mentioned the, the head of baseball operations that uh, you're looking at now. Can, can you go through a, a couple of things here? Can you go through like the pecking order? Is there a general manager under the head of baseball operations? And, and what is the input from people as far as that and the manager as well? So uh, first of all, Ed, uh, Good to see you again. If I put on my reading glasses, it'd be like looking in a mirror, okay? <laughs> Many people have said that, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, it's true, because I recognize those glasses. They're from uh, Walgreens, right? Yeah. Uh, no, CVS. But what... <laughs> okay, all right. So we both shop at the drugstore. Um, so with respect to the president of baseball operations, uh, you know, I think that what we're looking for is the most accomplished baseball person we can find. And from there, the rest of the structure will flow. So it's po very possible that we'll have a general manager b beneath that person. Um, but I think that, you know, we're gonna allow that person to have some input into how the, the structure ultimately is created. So, you know, I've got some ideas, um, but they're, you know, they're more general. You know, we want a very collaborative organization. I'm not gonna make the baseball decisions. I expect to have a seat at the table, but I don't expect to be, you know, seated at the head of the table. Uh, so we're gonna have a process. It's gonna be collaborative. Um, this person is gonna have a lot of uh, runway and um, we're gonna build the organization around him. Now, I think we've got some very capable people in house. And so it's, it's not as if we need to uh, start from scratch, but uh, once we get that person in, then I think we'll figure out you know, exact roles for existing personnel as well as some others that we may bring in. But, uh, you know, I'm very excited about that. As far as, uh, you know, the manager is concerned, with, with the caveat that this new baseball leader <clears throat> will have some input into the managerial decision. Uh, you know, I, I've told Louie that he's very likely our manager in 2011. Um, and so 20, uh, 21, uh, 21, I'm sorry. So, um, so from that standpoint, uh, you know, Louie and, Louis and I have had conversations. We've, uh, um, talked about the coaching staff and, uh, of course I know Louie from my years with the Mets before he's a very, uh, capable and, uh, um, fine individual and I like him a lot. Thank you. Next up, uh, Joel Sherman, your line is open. 
Sandy, uh, I, I know Steve Cohen tried to uh, dance of trying not to compare previous administrations to this one, but you literally worked for one and now you work for the other. And I wonder what you think is different for you now that this is something you want to do. Well, first of all, let me say that, that but for the opportunity that the uh, Wilpons and, and uh, Saul Katz gave me back in 2010, I wouldn't have had this opportunity. So, um, you know, what I hope is to be able to build on the experience I had before. There's no question that uh, their, their uh, ownership styles um, will differ. Uh, there's no question that, um, you know, there will be differences in the way we operate, uh, the differences in our uh, emphasis and, um, you know, overall sheer capacity to do things. Um, but, you know, what brought me back, as I said before, was Steve. I think there are, there are immense possibilities in connection with uh, this team. I have a, you know, I don't go back to the polo grounds in my relationship with the Mets. Um, probably my most memorable moment is Wilmer Flores getting the ball out on a Friday night. Um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a latecomer to the game as, as it relates to the Mets, but I'm, I'm no less invested, uh, not only uh, in terms of my, you know, professional commitment, but also emotionally. Um, so, I, you know, I'm excited. You know, I, I told I told the uh, employees earlier today, um, this is a this is an optimistic moment. I mean, for a lot of reasons, um, we have new ownership. The background is maybe we found, you know, a COVID vaccine. We got the election behind us. It's the Marine Corps birthday. Uh, it, you know, it's a great day. And uh, I can't tell you how, th how, how excited I am to be part of what's going to happen going forward. Sandy, can I follow with one other thing? Is, sure. uh, is what, what do you believe is the core value of the team as a contender right now? Like, where do you place it? And therefore, how do you handle this offseason to augment it if, for example, you think it's the core of a high-end contender? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, we have some real strengths. I think from an offensive standpoint, there are definitely some first division championship pieces. Um, Jacob deGrom is by definition um, uh, an ace. Uh, he's the definition of, of uh, Cy Young, if you will. Um, there, are, there are things that we do well. There's things that we don't do well. Um, and we need to shore up some positions. Our our uh, uh, our pitching staff is thin. Our depth at Double A AA and Triple A is thinner, thinner. Um, the bullpen is has been inconsistent. Um, <clears throat> we have needs uh, behind the plate. Our team defense is uh, and and honestly, I'll take some responsibility for even the team defense as it exists today uh, from the emphasis that. Uh, you know, we put on offense uh, years ago. So there are a lot of things that we need to do, but I think the, you know, there is a foundation there. And I think if we can add the right pieces this year, um, and Steve has indicated that we'll have the opportunity to do that, um, we can be pretty good pretty quickly. And that's my goal for, for 2021. Next up is Dave Lennon. Hey, Sandy, welcome back. Thanks, Dave. Um, I, I'm curious, you, you've known a lot of owners uh, in multiple sports probably too. Have you ever seen quite the dynamic that Steve has as far as a lifelong fan with the type of resources that he has and, and his knowledge for trying to put together a, a team? He, he seems to be kind of in a, in a unique category. No, I would agree with that. I think that, uh, you know, his history um, is passion for the team that goes far beyond just this uh, ownership bit, um, his resources. Um, but also, I think his success uh, at point 72 and the way in which he, you know, sees similarities uh, with the team. I've always said, you know, 
for a long time. There are more similarities between baseball and other businesses than there are dissimilarities. There, there are some things that are different. You know, there's a different vocabulary. There's a different set of, uh, uh, there's a different calendar. There, you know, there, there are differences, but, but not that many. And I think what you see over the last 10 or 15 years is teams like Boston, teams like Tampa Bay, teams like the Dodgers, recognizing those similarities and adapting them to the, to the, to the, the baseball industry. And that's what we want to do. And I think that, you know, we have the opportunity now not only to, you know, adopt things from, you know, the broader baseball community um, and for business generally, but from what's been really successful for Steve. And I think he articulated some of the things that are, that are transferable and that uh, it's not so much, res you know, it's not people, it's not uh, hardware, it's not, it's ideas. It's, uh, it's an approach um, and an emphasis on, on, uh, you know, how you run the business, uh, how you um, make decisions, um, and, you know, how you, how you achieve the professionalism uh, across the board that I think is part of what we want to create with the Mets as part of their reputation. We want to be, you know, we don't want to just be known for, um, for winning. We want to be known for how we win. And I think that's the difference between, you know, a great franchise and, and also a sustainable success, sustainably successful franchise and one that, you know, is hit and miss. Um, so, you know, the Mets are a sort of a, they're a storied franchise, if you will. Um, some of the stories have been good. Some of them have been bad. Um, and, uh, if we want to be an iconic franchise, which I think we are capable of doing, we have to write more good stories than bad, and occasionally we have to write a really epic story. And uh, you know, that's what that's what excites me about these 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 uh, next few months and and years because um, I think we have the chance to do that. Tyler Kepner, your line is open. Yeah, welcome back, Sandy. Good to see you again. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, you answered, you may have gotten around to some of it, um, in that answer, but at the very first thing you said is so your, your vision, um, Steve's vision parallels, uh, my own, I think is what you said. How, yeah. it, how so? Well, I'm going to read, I'm going to read something from the memo that I, you know, wrote for Steve, uh, I don't know, several months ago, first page, second paragraph, um, I'm afraid to put on my CVS glasses, but I'm going to try to read this. Um, a vision for new ownership to create an iconic major league franchise respected for its success, competitive and financial success, and how it achieves that success and for its commitment to fans and community. So, okay, it's a vision statement. You know, you start to unpack that. And as I said before, we want to be iconic. The Mets have a chance to do that. I'm not sure you can be a, iconic in most parts of the, of the United States, regardless of, uh, I mean, it's hard to do um, in a place that's not New York or Chicago or LA. It's been done, but uh, we have that opportunity in part because we're well located. Um, but in order to get there, we, you know, we've got to be sustainably excellent. Uh, that's the way we get there. Um, the Yankees and 27 or 28 or how many championships they have, they're iconic. We're not using them as a benchmark, but I think there are examples uh, for what we want to achieve, uh, you know, around the country in various sports. Uh, the, the thing that's really important to me as well, though, is, is being respected for how we get there. And so on page two of this little memo, it was about that piece of it. And, you know, we want to be, I hate to use some of these cliche words, uh, but, you know, we want to be authentic. We, you know, you're going to hear from me and, you know, you're, you're going to hear from Steve. You just saw Steve. I think he came across as pretty authentic. We're going to be out front. We're going to, want to communicate. We want to be professional. We want to be collaborative. We want to be innovative. Uh, 
Those are all kind of cliche. The real question is how do you execute on that? It's easy to say it. We all say we want to build a good farm system. Well, how are you going to do that? I mean, the, the real proof is, is, is in how you actually go about doing it. And so we're going to establish, we're going to have the resources. So first of all, you have to have capacity. You got to have enough people. You got to have the technology. You have to have the ability to um, run the analytics. You have to have a big enough scouting staff. On the business side, you have to have enough people selling tickets. You have to have enough people who are able to man all the social platforms, et cetera, et cetera. We want to be a fully built out professional organization. And in the meantime, treating our employees in a way that um, they have pride, not only because they happen to be affiliated with the Mets, but because they have pride in the way that the, the Mets function and uh, ultimately, you know, their performance. So, you know, with employees, so I get on with all you guys and it's on TV and all that sort of thing. We all make impressions on fans. Steve does, I do, but actually every single, every single person who works at the Mets makes impressions. And the Mets reputation is a sum of all those impressions. And, you know, I get an opportunity to make more impressions just because it's in the media, but every one of us has a chance to make impressions. And so, you know, I hope I empower our employees across the board, baseball and business, um, to, to make those impressions and feel good about the fact that they represent the Mets. And not just because they're fortunate enough to be working in sports, but because they, they feel they're really fortunate enough to work for the Mets. How much did it hurt you that, um, you know, the Mets have uh, acquired, maybe earned this reputation, um, you know, for making some, I don't know how you'd put it, but some uh, questionable decisions or crazy things that happen and LOL Mets, all that stuff, you know all about it. Like how much did that yeah. hurt the pride of being, of working for the Mets and what the organization is supposed to stand for? Well, you know, when I first joined the Mets in 2010, I remember walking by bus stops in Manhattan and it, you know, it was, it, there, there were, um, there were, somebody had built a, an advertising campaign around the sort of ineptitude of the New York Mets. Uh, that didn't feel good. Um, and we, you know, we went about trying to change that perception. And for a period of time, I think maybe we were successful, but we, we can't do it just periodically. You don't change perception without some sort of consistently uh, successful message. And that message comes from all the things that we do. It's not just making a trade, you know, that turns out well or turns out poorly. It's it's all the other little things. It's the phone calls to to fans. It's uh, it again. It's a sum of all of those impressions. So you don't change the perception without changing the reality. You're not going to. They're not often the same, but you're not going to have a positive perception for long if you know the underlying facts don't just just don't support it so we have to do a lot of things well and i think steve is going to go a long way toward changing that narrative i really do it's going to give us some some uh, leeway um you know with the mets often or anything you know i used to say this about the umpires if you if an umpire makes a mistake there are two different reactions that can result the average fan will say, ah, they all stink. They all make mistakes, they're terrible, they stink. But if you've created an environment where somebody can respond and say, you know what, these guys are great, but everybody makes a mistake once in a while. And so it's really about changing the underlying perception so that when things happen, they're not interpreted, you know, consistently negatively or, 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 or uh, you know, in some other fashion that, that is, doesn't put the, the team in best light. So, uh, you know, I'll stop talking, but I, I think that, you know, we gotta, we gotta change the perception, but I think, you know, Steve's gonna give us a real chance to do that. Next up is Mark Carrig. Hey, Sandy, Mark Carrig from The Athletic. Um, just wondering, like, in just in the last year and a half, like, you know, being away from, like, day-to-day -day operation of a team. Uh, I guess, did that time give you a chance to sort of reflect on these philosophies that you're talking about 
And if so, I'm just curious, like, has anything changed in your worldview of how to run a baseball team? You know, just having that opportunity to have like that kind of away from the day to day. That's a good question. Um, first of all, I, I don't think um, my view of how to run a successful baseball team has changed. Uh, I think what this will do is give me an opportunity to perhaps implement some of those ideas. Um, you know, when I was with uh, Oakland the last couple of years, um, you know, I wasn't directly involved in trade commerce. I mean, occasionally, but you know, they, they, had, they got a great baseball operation there. They didn't need me to, you know, uh, um, help them with, uh, you know, their, their trade possibilities. What I really enjoyed though, was um, talking with minor league staff in particular and major league staff um, coaches and Bob Melvin about the game and not only about the game, but about some of these ideas. You know, I remember uh, talking to the whole minor league staff one day about the importance of a coach having some curiosity. You know, one of the problems we have in the game today is that, you know, we have these, the analytic group and we have the um, scouting group, if you will, the traditional scouting group. And sometimes they talk a different language, but sometimes they don't even talk to each other. Um, you know, one side might be resentful. The other side might be um, uh, sort of um, dis not disrespectful, but, you know, unwilling to sort of admit the value. And we, we end up with, you know, at loggerheads. And to me, what curiosity means is that you're willing to grow in, you know, yourself, but also you're, you're curious about people around you. I, it, you know, it's not just, it's not empathy as much as it is, gee, having real respect for what other people do and an interest in finding out how they do it. And I think that's what we're gonna try to foster with the Mets, not just in baseball, but in business as well. Uh, you know, we want people who are curious about others because when you're curious about somebody else, there, there, there's a certain level of respect that goes along with it and uh, a willingness to be open-minded. And I think, you know, what we need is uh, some of that open-mindedness because that's the real key of how to blend the analytics and the human side. Um, you're not going to you're not going to get there um, without kind of a mutual respect for for both parties. Anthony Tacomo, your line is open. Hey, Sandy, I, I have two quickly. Um, one, just uh, what assurances perhaps did you receive from Steve Cohen that you will have freedom, sort of quote unquote, carte blanche to do things the way you want to do it, and how might that contrast with your previous tenure here? Look, I, uh, look, I'm an employee, okay? <laughs> uh, I've always felt my job, uh, whether wherever I was, and um, certainly, you know, my last tenure with the Mets, my job was not to make all of the final decisions. My job was to make a lot of the decisions, but in certain cases, make recommendations. I mean, there are, there are seminal events that take place, whether it's a, you know, a hundred, million dollar contract or something of that sort, that's not a decision uh, I'm going to make exclusively. And that's, you know, that's something that I'm going to discuss with Steve. My job is to make recommendations. And ultimately, if I'm successful, uh, he'll accept my recommendations more often than he won't. Um, but, you know, I'm comfortable with the, the relationship that I've established with Steve already. You know, we talk, I don't know, two or three times a day. When he's eating the sandwich, when the market slows down at noon, you know, he calls me up and asks me some question that, you know, I don't know what he's going to ask me, but usually they're, they're insightful questions. And, uh, you know, hopefully I have a response. But I think, you know, intellectually, a uh, variety of ways, professionally, this is going to be a real challenge for me. And, and part of it just, just uh, emanates from the fact that um, Steve is so animated and into it. And I think in a positive way, you know, I don't, I don't think he's going to, as he said, he's got a day job, you know, and uh, he probably needs that day job to pay for some of the, you know, 
potential losses we have with the Mets. Um, so from my standpoint, that's a good thing. Um, and also just uh, how long do you want to do this? Uh, you know, coming on at age 72, is this an open-ended thing for you? Or is this uh, something that you want to maybe steward over for a couple of years? Do you want to do it until you win? I mean, what's kind of your personal timeline with this? Yeah, so I've, you know, I've committed to a couple of years, uh, but it's open-ended. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, referencing my age. <laughs> Apologies. It is, it is what it is. Uh, I don't want to die with my boots on, but, uh, you know, I think this is going to be a great couple of years. We'll see where it goes. And um, um, uh, that's all I can say. Thank you. Next up is Mike Puma. Uh, Mike Puma from the New York Post. Uh, Sandy, just wondering, uh, from what aisle of the supermarket would you say you're shopping in this aisle? So this is the uh, Scott Boris uh, uh, approach to interpreting uh, Mets intentions in free agency, I guess. Um, so here's how I would respond. I would say that, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to make sure we got enough meat and potatoes, but we're going to be shopping in the gourmet section as well. How, how does it feel to be able to shop in the gourmet section after not always being permitted to go there in the past? I don't know. I got to find out where it is. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Next question comes from Disha Thozar. Hey, Sandy. Um, just you kind of already touched on this, but you said that your mindset and your ideas of how to run a successful baseball team haven't really changed. Um, now you can just you have the freedom to implement them. How do you kind of respond to fans who might be cautious of your return to the organization? Um, and just kind of how will your tenure as president be different this time? Oh, uh, well, you know, I think to understand or, or uh, have an expectation about the way that I'm going to approach this job, you, you got to go all the way back to uh, the last century, unfortunately. Um, there was a time when I had it, my team, the Oakland A's, had the largest payroll in baseball. Um, in the early 80s, we started adopting analytics. Uh, we kept it quiet because we thought it might be a competitive advantage. Um, the data didn't exist um, at that time the way it does now. So a lot of these concepts that have subsequently been, you know, proven and kind of built out were, were just ideas at the time, but they were concepts you could actually follow. So in terms of how I'm going to, you know, approach this, I wouldn't want people to just look at my tenure with the Mets and make assumptions. Um, you know, we, even with the Mets, I think that, you know, we were, you know, I, I probably was characterized as patient. Um, I don't know that it, that it equates with, you know, sloth-like. Um, you know, patience is a virtue, I think, but you got to know when to pull the trigger. Patience for in and of itself is probably not a virtue. <laughs> Timing is. Um, so we, we did some, I think we took some risks, uh, you know, last time we took some risks with uh, various people. Some of them worked out, some of them didn't. Um, tried to do it at the right time. But in any event, I, I think that, uh, I think that the environment will be a little bit different and I think the fans' expectations are already very different. And um, there's no reason to think that the way I approach things won't be a little bit different as well. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Tim Britton, your line is open. Hi, Sandy. Tim Britton with The Athletic. Yeah, Tim. Uh, kind of on similar lines there. You know, you have the familiarity of being in this organization for eight years as it is run one way and now it appears it's going to be run a pretty different way how does that familiarity with with what it could be here maybe enhance your optimism or enthusiasm for for what changes you can kind of make manifest this time around uh good question so i think 
I think my familiarity with the organization goes beyond the individuals. And uh, uh, so I don't know everybody in the organization at this point. It's been turnover, you know, for a couple of years, but I do, I do know a, a large number of people. More importantly, I think I know how they function. I know how they interact. I know where we're strong and, and to some extent, I think where we're weak. Um, and this is, this is not with respect just to individuals, it's respect with respect to um, uh, categories of, uh, of activity. So if you take player development, you know, it's not just player development uh, generally, it's about the coaching staffs, the performance group, the um, uh, analytics uh, integrated with that group. You know, there are a variety of different things. And I think I have a little more granular knowledge of the Mets than most people would just coming in. In fact, I know I have a lot more. Um, so I have some pretty strong ideas that are predicated on my experience, but also my observation of the way things are done elsewhere today. Um, you know, you wouldn't be talking to me today at age 72 if I, I wasn't curious myself and wasn't interested in understanding you know, where things have come, where they can go, uh, and um, have an open and sort of progressive mindset. So it's not like I have ideas that I wanna, you know, I wanna imprint. I, it's, it's really about gleaning a lot of things that are currently, I think, working for other clubs and, uh, and bringing them to the Mets. And so I hope my experience, not only in terms of years, but also you know, recently with the Mets and with the A's and so forth. Um, and also my experience with the competition committee, the rules committee, um, uh, that there's a contemporary approach to what we're trying to do. Um, and that's what, that's what I hope we can achieve. And then you, you joked about needing to find the gourmet aisle, but uh, do you have to kind of, uh, is there a mindset you need to get across to some people who have been with the Mets for a long time that they can maybe think bigger or think differently at least than they have in the past? Yes, I think that's the case. Um, you know, for example, um, uh, when Brad Hand was on waivers last week, um, you know, one year, $10 million. Um, if the timing had been a little bit different, you know, we might have jumped on that. Now, is that a good deal? I don't know. It's probably overpaying a little bit. Who knows? Um, but today, given what we want to achieve, um, it's not about how much less we can get somebody for. It's more about getting that somebody. Now, I don't want to create the impression that we're just going to go out and you know, sign a bunch of players. But I think we... We now can emphasize the acquisition rather than the cost. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. Next up is uh, Ron Blum. Ronnie. Yes, Sandy. How did you first meet uh, Steve? And what was that like? I first met Steve um, in New York in December of last year at a breakfast arranged by Andy Cohen, his uh, uh, right-hand person at uh, Cohen Private Ventures. Uh, Andy is really the guy that uh, uh, got me involved in this originally. Andy was the guy who represented Steve at minority owner meetings uh, at City Field. Uh, Andy's the guy that I got to know somewhat through those meetings. And um, you know that was my original connection to Steve. So, um, you know, we met uh, in December. It was in connection with uh, the first iteration of this transaction. Uh, and then it went into, you know, I mean, maybe it was a casual conversation, but it went into to, uh, hibernation for a long period of time. And Steve was able basically to thread the needle over the next several months. And uh, um, so, our relationship wasn't really cemented until, you know, I would say recent months, but I first met him in December of last year. 
next uh, question is from Eric Fisher. Hey, Sandy, good afternoon. So question about the uh, minor leagues, which we've obviously talked a lot. We're in the midst of uh, some large scale changes across the affiliated system and in particular your way anticipating some changes with Brooklyn. But uh, broadly, how do you see this whole shakeout playing out for the Mets? Well, I think that, uh, you know, you know, we're going to lose some minor league franchises and, and on its face. Uh, um, I'm not really happy about that. I think that, you know, the minor leagues provide more than just players. They provide um, a presence in a lot of small communities that are able to make a connection between Major League Baseball and, um, and the players that are, are there in front of them. Having said that, I think Major League Baseball is, is going to do a great job of expanding opportunities in those areas where uh, teams are, are going to be um, eliminated. So overall, based on what I've heard as recently as yesterday, I really think you know they, they've got a, a cogent plan in place. For us, um, you know, we're going to be in Syracuse. Uh, we're going to be in Binghamton. We're going to be in St. Lucie, and we'll be in Brooklyn. Um, and the nice thing about Brooklyn is that it, I think it's going to become a full season affiliate. So people can start watching uh, baseball on Coney Island in April if they can stand the wind coming off the ocean. <laughs> but I think it's a great opportunity for, for local baseball, and we're really excited about, uh, about our continuing affiliation with all of those four teams. There will be you know, other players in St. Lucie beyond the, the, the team that's playing there. It's going to be a little different, but I think there's some positives associated with the changes. You know, one of the one of the problems for de with developing players is they play too often. You know, they play every day, and you don't always you don't you don't always develop just through performance. There, there's a lot of other uh, you know there's a lot of other uh, time that could be well spent developing skills, and I think some of our players were able to take advantage of that this year. So, you know, there's some, some positives, there's some negatives, um, but I, I think, you know, we will end up with a very strong organization. As Steve pointed out, we're going to grow our own players. Um, you know, I think that uh, the Mets have drafted very well over the last eight or 10 years, including, I think, the last two years. I really like the approach they took. Um, so, we're going to draft those players. I'm going to assume based on our track record that they're going to be pretty good and we're going to hold on to them. Um, you know, there, there are only two currencies in baseball, players and money. And if you're going to give up fewer players, you're going to have to expend more money. And I think what will happen with Steve is that we're going to have the opportunity to sort of husband our players uh, uh, in ways that maybe we weren't able to do before. Thank you, Sandy. Time for uh, about two more. Uh, Bradford Davis, your line's open. Hi, Sandy. Nice to meet you. Bradford hey. Davis from the New York yes. Daily News. Um, I, you know, just going back to the que uh, question, that, uh, or rather an answer you gave to Anthony um, earlier today, uh, you said that, uh, you know, Steve has often asked you very insightful questions, you know, um, as you guys are, you know, building a relationship and building this team. I'm curious if there are any, whether were there any, you know, particularly insightful sort of conversations that you had that impressed or even surprised you, you know, about him, you know, whether it is his, you know, his strategy, his leadership, et cetera. Well, one of the things that's impressed me is uh, the, just the dialogue that we've had. So, you know, it hasn't just been about me answering questions. It's actually been a dialogue. And, um, um, I've enjoyed them partly for their for their content, but partly for the fact that they, you know, take place on sort of an even balanced basis. Um, these aren't challenging questions per se. They're questions, they're learning questions um, and not probing in the sense of accountability, but probing in the sense of education. And, uh, you know, I don't know that there's anything that, stands out you know one conversation might be with a particular player who for some reason was on the news um another question might 
uh, arise from a from a Twitter response that he uh, may have gotten. Um, so there's a breadth of questions and a variety of answers. He keeps me on my toes, and uh, that's what I like. You know, I like I like being challenged, and uh, that's that's what's happened with Steve. Good. Uh, last question, uh, Justin Toscano. We'll open up your line. Hey, Sandy. Uh, welcome back. Obviously, the game is pretty rapidly changing as it relates to kind of organizational infrastructure, especially in front offices. In what ways do you think not only Steve's vision, but but the resources he's able to provide will help you guys be kind of on the cutting edge of some of those changes? Well, I think that uh, I think first and foremost, the Mets have been become a very attractive landing place. I think that's true across the board. Suddenly, overnight, um, I think people are interested in working for the Mets who within the game who perhaps were not before. Um, I think that players are interested in, in the Mets for reasons they might not have been before. Um, so, you know, from that standpoint, I think that we've really got an opportunity here to be selective, whether it's you know, and how we build out our uh, operation, our front office on the baseball side, the business side, but also with respect to players and coaches. And um, I think that's a great place for us to be in because ultimately the success of the organization is going to be predicated on the quality of the people who work for the Mets. And, uh, you know, one of my jobs is to make sure that we have that quality of individual. And at the same time, we have the you know, the systems, the processes that leverage that ability in individuals. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I'm focused on is um, finding good people, rewarding good people, wherever they are within the organization and providing a structure and a uh, process that leverages their abilities. Um, and ultimately leads to, you know, some success hopefully for us. Sandy, uh, with that, want to thank you very much for all your time this afternoon and also want to especially thank uh, everybody else who participated in this call. Uh, moving forward, please reach out if there's any further assistance uh, we can provide or any additional uh, information. And with that, we look forward to uh, seeing and speaking with everybody again soon. Everybody, Thanks, stay everybody. Safe. Yeah, thanks, for everybody. I, I enjoyed it. You wore me out, and uh, I look forward to doing it again. Thanks, Sandy. Bye-bye, everybody. Okay.